Your passion for wanting to help those around you is what defines you. That definition becomes fully realized with your Master of Physician Assistant Studies in the School of Health Professions at the University of North Texas Health Science Center at Fort Worth. But you're not content with just sitting in a large classroom. You want to be part of something special. With the Master of Physician Assistant Studies program, you'll be surrounded by coursework that provides you experiential, hands-on learning environments that prepare you for a wide spectrum of specialties that break from the norm. State-of-the-art interactive classrooms, hands-on real-life situational learning, virtual reality, and an opportunity to learn from exceptionally qualified professors that come from a vast range of clinical specialties. With our low faculty to student ratio, you'll be assured that your future mentor is only a few steps away to guide and support you every step of the way. You'll be prepared for what comes next. Our program has an all-time 99% pass rate on the PANS exam. From hospitals to surgical centers to clinics, you'll be ready. Surround yourself in an interdisciplinary environment that fosters individual growth as a healthcare professional, where a diverse group of high-performing peers will become your future colleagues. And it all happens in the vibrant arts district of the 13th largest city in the United States. Plus, with some of the most competitive tuition rates in the country, your journey to becoming a valuable member of healthcare teams around the world is invaluable. Unlock your potential in the Master of Physician Assistant Studies program at the University of North Texas Health Science Center at Fort Worth. Contact the School of Health Professions and start making your impact today. You're driven to excel, and your future in one of the fastest growing healthcare careers in the U.S. starts at the School of Health Professions at the University of North Texas Health Science Center at Fort Worth. You don't want to be lost in the crowd, and with the Doctor of Physical Therapy program's low faculty to student ratio, you'll be closely mentored by faculty with contemporary clinical practice, clinical specialists, and trained educators faculty that will prepare you to make an impact beyond what you could imagine. First class clinical instructors with clinical rotations across Texas and beyond that care about training you to succeed in an array of clinical settings from skilled nursing to home health to acute care. But you've always wanted to be one step ahead. And that's why at the Health Science Center, we train you for the tomorrow of physical therapy with an innovative team-based curriculum that combines a wide-ranging expertise in contemporary physical therapy. State-of-the-art interactive classrooms. True-to-life skill labs. The latest in research opportunities. and a heart for service, wrapped up in coursework that will challenge you every step of the way. Plus, our program has an overall 99% employment rate after graduation and a 98% first-time pass rate on the NPTE. You'll quickly be on your way to making your mark in your community and the world. And all this happens in the vibrant arts district of the 13th largest city in the United States. This is your chance to surround yourself with diverse, high-achieving peers that will push you to realize your true potential in a true interdisciplinary environment. And with one of the most competitively priced tuitions in the country, you can unlock your potential in the Doctor of Physical Therapy program at the University of North Texas Health Science Center. Contact the School of Health Professions today to prepare for your tomorrow. Good evening and welcome everyone. We are thrilled to have you here today joining us both in person and online. It's wonderful to see so many leaders working to advance workforce opportunities within the health professions. My name is Glenn Forrester. I'm the Dean of the School of Health Professions here at the Health Science Center. In our school, we offer the Doctor of Physical Therapy, Master of Physician Assistant Studies, and the Master of Science in Lifestyle, Health Sciences, and Coaching degrees. 
Our outstanding programs provide the knowledge, experience, and skills necessary to ensure that our students excel in their chosen professions. Things I would like to share with you include that our school is the first in the nation to combine lifestyle medicine and health and wellness coaching in our Masters of Lifestyle Health and Sciences coaching program. This one-year fully online program gives graduates the knowledge and skills to cost-effectively address lifestyle behaviors to, pr to promote sustainable change for optimal health and well-being. It's estimated that 70 to 80 percent of chronic disease conditions such as type 2 diabetes, coronary heart disease, hypertension, obesity, and some types of cancer are, a direct, are directly attributable to lifestyle behaviors. As a result, 75 percent of our healthcare dollars go towards treating these lifestyle-related conditions. This is a model of care that is not sustainable. We are proud to be on the forefront of equipping graduates to promote change. Our physical therapy program has seen 10 years of graduates enter the workforce with outstanding success. We average a 100% employment rate within the first year of graduation. According to the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, employment of PTs is projected to grow 15% from 22 to, 20, to 32, 2032, much faster than average for all occupations for many reasons, including an aging population, increased chronic health conditions, growing interest in sports and fitness activities, leading to more sport-related injuries, and expanded access to healthcare coverage and rehab. Our, prog our PA program has a longstanding tradition of excellence as well. We are proud to say that our program has seen more than 1,000 PA graduates over, their, over the last 26 years. Our graduates are serving throughout Texas, in the U.S., and beyond truly making a difference in the lives of their patients. From an 11-member inaugural class to now welcoming 75 new PA students each year, we're working to meet the growing demand of this profession. Similar to the PT profession, the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics says the demand for PAs is expected to grow 27% from 2022 to 20, 2032. This can be attributed to, again, healthcare workforce shortages, the aging population, an expanded role in the healthcare system, and cost efficiency to improve access to care. We have an incredible group of speakers with us this evening who will share more about their fields and the challenges and topics related to these fields. It's my distinct pleasure to introduce first Erica Jackson, Chief Coaching Officer at Well Coaches, a leader in the health and wellness coaching industry. In her role, Ms. Jackson leads the development of training and curriculum to build excellent skills for thousands of coaches around the world. After earning a master's degree focusing on human resources and adult learning, she led training in Fortune 500 and governmental organizations. With thousands of hours of coaching experience, Erica is a master certified and national board certified coach. She's also a mentor coach and examiner for the International Coach Federation serves on the Program Approval Commission for the National Board for Health and Wellness Coaching, and is chair of the Health and Wellness Coaching Member Interest Group for the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. It's a lot. In addition to her contributions to coaching research, she is co-author of a peer-reviewed coaching psychology manual published by Walters and Kluwer, and behavioral change component of ACLM board review course and a pilot study of health and wellness coaching for fibromyalgia. Please join me in welcoming Erica Jackson. I'm also the mother of an 18-year-old boy who still lives at home. So if you thought that was a lot. <laughs> so I was asked to share about what's on my mind related to health and wellness coaching. And so I want to talk about putting coaching into healthcare. Get it? Get my slide. Coaching into healthcare. <laughs> and so my topics today will be first undefining well-being. Uh, a little bit radical, but, but hang with me. 
the way that you as healthcare providers can become a social resource to your patients and clients, and I'll talk more about what I mean by social resource, and then just a little bit about what's going on in our industry as a whole. So health and wellness coaching is based in the idea that we can support our patients and clients in developing their well-being. But what is well-being? Well, for me, it is a stroll through a cornfield looking at wildflowers. It's sitting on the porch on a Sunday afternoon uh, after uh, a, a long morning of work and having my husband deliver lunch to me. I get really fulfilled by spending time with different cultures and learning about various traditions. And I um, love to, um, to spend time with my children. So that's very unique to me. Right? And it is because of my experiences growing up. I grew up in the country, in a very sparsely populated place, so I feel at home in that spaciousness. I have the ability to rest on Sunday rather than go to work. And the benefit of having a spouse and the ability to buy delicious food to eat on the porch in the afternoon. I love to get to know about different cultures because I did that growing up. And I also have a real desire for peace because I grew up in a very violent home. But if that vision for well-being was the perspective that I applied to all of my clients or patients, it would be a real disservice and, and dishonor of their own experiences and what fulfills them. So I'm going to go wild here. And I want you to all just shout out a couple of words that define well-being for you. I'll do it on a count of three so there isn't that awkwardness. All right. Why don't you aim for two or three words? One, two, three. Yeah, all completely different. Couldn't you tell? Right, so the bottom line is that well-being is based on the individual. It's rooted in their cultures and traditions and values and perspectives and experiences. And our models of well-being are often also rooted in privilege and an assumption that things are available to everyone, and an assumption that everyone has the same life choices. And what I want to remind us about is that there is no one right way to do well-being. But there are some standards for us to keep in mind. I'm sure that you all are familiar with the Thrive model from the World Health Organization. And I think, you know, this does a good job of covering wellness, particularly considering the community, one's environment, and equitable opportunities. But others might look at this model and ask, what about, what about meaning, purpose? What about spirituality? That's missing from this model. And then we learn a lot from the field of positive psychology. Who's familiar with positive psychology? Okay, a couple of you. So positive psychology really isn't all that new. Carl Jung was talking about it, but not naming it as positive psychology many, many years ago. But it came into prominence in the, early t uh, in the early 2000s when Martin Seligman became the president of the American Psychological Association and said, you know, we have a lot of studies. In fact, our whole industry is, our profession is based on studying what's wrong with people and what's broken here. But what about what's going right? Couldn't we study that? 
and learn how to create more of what's good in people, what makes them thrive. So from that umbrella, we have theories around languishing versus flourishing. When we're languishing, we are having a sense of emptiness, a feeling of despair, a stuckness. And by the way, before COVID, um, research told us that about 55% of the population was experiencing languishing at any given moment. I'm going to guess that that number is higher now. When we're flourishing, we're full of energy and confidence, and we have a sense of control over our own lives. So flourishing may be one way to define well-being. There's also, uh, developed by the way, by Martin Seligman, the Values in Action Assessment. This is a really wonderful tool to use with your patients and clients to support them in identifying their strengths. And there are six key categories of strengths, which I don't have memorized, so I will read them. Wisdom and knowledge is one. Courage, humanity, justice, temperance, and transcendence. I love that one, though that is not one of my key strengths. And then pa Barbara Fredrickson is a really prominent psychologist in this field, and Barbara identified our top 10 positive emotions. And I'm going to read these to you and just invite you to ponder whether you've experienced any of these today. Joy, gratitude, serenity, interest, pride, amusement, inspiration, awe, love, and hope. So Fredrickson would say that these are the basis for well-being. But can you imagine kind of pushing someone, trying to force someone into seeing hope in a situation? Because we believe that that is the right emotion for them to have. When they are living in an environment where hope is really hard to find and disappointment is plentiful. Seligman was busy. He also developed this, this theory of well-being, this PERMA theory, which is about feeling good, finding flow, that's engagement. You know, when you are, you know, you're in the groove with what you're doing. I'm sure all of you who work here at UNT experience that feeling of flow on a daily basis. Having relationships that are authentic, having a sense of purpose, and getting at the end of the day to say, yeah, I did it. Having that sense of accomplishment at the end of the day. Then there's motivation. Some might say that we're experiencing well-being when we are engaging in things that come to us internally, autonomously. Um, when we are driven externally, like cleaning the kitchen, for example, we might clean the kitchen so that our spouse isn't disappointed in us. Or clean the kitchen because we feel like a bad roommate if we don't. That's an external driven motivation. But when we are tapped into our internal autonomous motivations, we're doing things like cleaning the kitchen because it feels good. I'm actually one of those weird people who love to clean. <laughs> we're doing it because we see that it serves a greater purpose, a greater good. And then we also have a bias, uh, at least in my industry, toward goal setting, particularly encouraging our clients to set smart goals, very specific goals, and to set long-term goals. But some folks are really uncomfortable committing to that. 
they have trouble thinking beyond tomorrow, let alone thinking what their goals are a year from now or five years from now. So it's a bias that we bring to our conversations. DC and Ryan introduced us to self-determination theory, the idea that we are all striving to be in control of one's life. You know, that's the ultimate in well-being. But I'm wondering, what happens when our patients and clients are in environments that are out of control and where they really see no opportunities to feel at choice. And then, of course, there are the numerous wellness wheels. You might be familiar with the one from the National Institute of, well, uh, of uh, National Wellness Institute, excuse me. They have seven areas of well being, uh, and this one on the right comes from Gallup. There's some similarities here, but the question is do they all need to be in balance? For us to be well? Do they need to be balanced all the time? Or can someone feel a sense of well-being if their social life is full, if that slice of the pie is great, and they don't care so much about the physical aspect of their well-being? And as I say that out loud, I want you to gauge your reaction to that comes up for you internally if you consider someone who feels really full when their social bucket and social needs are met, but physicality isn't that important to them. Now, we did a project with Indian Health Services, and they had their own model of well-being. And what really struck me about this model was in the bottom uh, in the uh, bottom circle there, it says balance. My goodness, I hadn't seen that anywhere else. That really resonates with me. And then lastly, we did a project with the Episcopalian Church in Baltimore, uh, the Union of Black Episcopalians. And we were training peer leaders in their community to do coaching with underserved populations. And their definition of well-being was self-love and being able to advocate for oneself. So very unique to the culture and circumstance and environment of that time. Is your head starting to spin? Right? about all these definitions of well-being. And of course, you're familiar with the social determinants of health, the other things that we have found drive one's health and well-being. I want to be a little bit controversial here. I am, I am on a son of, somewhat of a personal mission to eliminate the word determinants and name this social influencers of health. For me, there's a lot more hope in the word influence here. There's a lot more possibility in this space. And I'd be remiss to not mention the role of uh, mental well-being when it comes to well-being. And to simply name that uh, when it comes to uh, the role of a wellness coach in this space, we see a lot of possibility. Uh, for example, we are partnered with an organization that's um, placing health and wellness coaches at a university where the waiting list for students to get to see a therapist at the university was up to six weeks long. And with well coaches in place to bridge that gap, they were at least getting human connection to someone within a day. So, I want to 
just invite you for a moment to think through the constructs of well-being that I shared or your own construct of well-being. And in a very coach-like way, I want to invite you, you're going to hate it, but you'll also benefit from it, to turn to the person next to you and just name what, I know, I know, what is, what's good about your own vision of well-being? But what might it also be missing, given the quick tour that we went through a moment ago? And lastly, if you're willing, how can you prevent your own personal bias around well-being from clouding, from preventing you from hearing what your patient's vision of well-being is. We're just going to take one whole minute. So you will live through this. Go. Five, four, three, two, one. You see how much connection can be made in just one minute? So, on to my proposal that you can become a social resource for health and well being. Let me take you through a few of my perspectives on how. You can be a social resource by providing empathy to your patients. You can listen with a clear mind. You can be with that person, not your checklist, not what you've brought into the room or into the call from the previous meeting not your to-do list of what's going to happen after your conversation. So find your own practice for clearing your mind and being an open vessel for them to pour themselves into. This also means letting go of your expectations. It means letting go of your need for them to be successful in order to validate your worth as a professional. See some head nods there. Let go of their need to succeed in order for you to feel good. And love them or, or appreciate them or just be okay with them for who they are and what they bring in that moment. So pause here for a moment and and just think of that person to whom you need to extend that kind of grace right now. Is it a patient, a client, a teenage son? <laughs> you can be a resource for empathy by asking open questions that encourage them to tell their story and them to learn from their story. So moving beyond, you know, how are you or did you accomplish your goal or did you take your meds or did you do that exercise to what's the best thing that happened to you this week and what strengths showed up and what led you to make that good, healthy choice and what are you proud of and what are you still hoping for? And you can repeat and reframe what you're hearing through reflections, which not only signal to them that you're listening, 
but also help them to hear themselves and think, oh, wow, yeah, that's exactly what I meant, or, oh, I didn't realize it came out of my mouth that way. That is not what I was feeling or thinking. And reflecting also reduces your temptation to correct instead of connect and to be the interrogator and sole problem solver instead of partner in the relationship. You can also be a resource of autonomy. You can support this in your relationship even when they're experiencing low resources, when they're in environments of scarcity. You can center your conversations on helping them identify what resources are available to them, what is within their control, reminding them that all, capital A-L-L, -L, choices about their behavior are theirs and that you're not going to be disappointed or let go, let, excuse me, let down by any of those choices, that they own them. They're not accountable to us. We're not an authority over them. We are a thinking partner alongside of them. And we can be a social resource by supporting them in visioning, holding out hope for their possibility without ignoring the real challenge of their environment, without ignoring the true social influencers of health. Don't be afraid to talk about what's hard, what obstacles they face. Get real in those conversations, but also help them get real about what are the true obstacles and what are the imagined obstacles. Hold them in positive regard, meaning believe in their capacity to do their best. Believe that they're doing their very best even when they're not. And be really aware of the concept of ecological fallacy, where we make assumptions about an individual based on stereotypes in a group of individuals. Because no group is monolithic, and every single person's definition of well-being is different, just as we heard in this space. Honor what their vision is, not our hope for what their vision is. And honor the distance of that vision. It may be closer or farther than some of your other patients. A bold long-term vision can be really easy for those of us who have lots of access to resources but can be terrifying and seemingly impossible for folks who don't, whose vision just might be to get to safety the next day or have enough food on the table. So ask what is their vision, what is their meaning and purpose, and let go of what seems right or big enough for you. We're a resource to them by supporting them in building their own self-efficacy, right? Build their confidence when you're working on goals together, if they want to set goals, I should say. Explore really deeply what it'll take for them to be successful. Ask that question. What do you need to have in place to, to experience a win here? What are the external resources that you need? But also, what are the internal resources you need? What are the strengths that you have within you? What are you good at? What do you enjoy doing? What, where do you shine and what comes naturally? Because building on those things will support them in what's most challenging. So... Just to note then, 
about the future. Oh, sorry, there is one more slide here. Um, about authenticity. Lastly, be real. Give them the space to express what scares them. Don't bring the, oh, but you should feel really excited. You should feel happy. If they're scared, if they're anxious, if they're nervous, allow them to express that without you feeling like you need to fix it. And explore their limitations, as I named. Give them the space to check out with themselves. Is this a real or imagined fear? Where did it come from? Is it something that's filled in truth or a story that I made up? And then support them in uncovering their resources. So just a couple of questions for you to take with you to help you question your own assumptions and biases. I'll give you a second to read through those. So I encourage you to have a real clarity and intentionality around understanding what your own sense of well-being is, what you bring of that um, set of assumptions, beliefs, and biases into all of your relationships. Understand what shaped those beliefs for you. And allow your client to instead drive the conversation about what well-being is while you are there as a social resource for them. Just one quick note about the future of coaching. Um, just wanted to let you know that in um, February of this year, a group of 11 applicants, large medical societies, insurance organizations came together and applied to the AMA uh, to establish Category 1 reimbursement codes for health and wellness coaching. We already have Category 3 codes. Primarily, some, some are being paid out for that category, but primarily designed um, to, do, to do data collection so that we can establish health and well-being coaching as a field. And so in that submission, they submitted data from 72 organizations that were doing health and wellness coaching that represented 4.9 million lives, 4.9 million coaching sessions. Pretty exciting to see how this field has grown since I joined it in, uh, in 2002. In June, um, the, they met with the AMA panel. This organization met. Um, they were denied Category 1 codes for health and wellness coaching because uh, they said that coaching can be covered under existing Category 1 codes for chronic pain and preventative medicine. Uh, so we're still exploring what that means. Uh, then... Uh, almost concurrently, Medicare uh, in June released a statement saying that it was going to begin paying for coaching via telehealth uh, temporarily for 2024. And so now the leading organizations in this industry um, have submitted uh, their support letters uh, in hoping that that becomes a permanent standard so that we are uh, within healthcare more and more in the future. So that is uh, exciting news, and we are really grateful uh, and, and in awe, I should say, of this, this university, who is really on the leading edge, I will tell you, of integrating this work uh, into your curriculum. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much for that, and thank you for reminding us of the sort of patient-centered paradigm. I think, 
you know, we, we forget about it. And, you know, it's like big data and AI and all the stuff that's emerging. What you just spoke about is what keeps, is going to what, what keeps human beings involved in the care of patients. So thank you so much. It's now my pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Tara Jo Manal, who serves as Senior Vice President of Scientific Affairs in the American Physical Therapy Association. APTA is an individual membership professional organization representing 100,000 member PTs, PT assistants, and students of PT. Dr. Manal leads the research, practice, innovation, and career advancement divisions within APTA. Her unit produces professional education opportunities for clinicians, reports on the profession, the physical therapy provides the physical therapy journal, practice advisories, and this year updated an updated guide to PT practice and an APTA research agenda. Wow, a lot of stuff. Um, prior to joining APTA, Dr. Manal was the universe at the University of Delaware as director of physical therapy clinical services and director of the UD residency training programs and associate professor for 28 years. She is dual certified emeritus as sports and orthopedic physical therapy clinical specialist and associate professor in the PT department. Dr. Manal has received numerous awards at the national level for excellence in teaching and service and is an international speaker on areas of rehabilitation. She recently held a position on the State of Delaware Innovation and Healthcare Practice and Education Committee and is a Catherine Worthingham Fellow of the American Physical Therapy Association. We're thrilled to have you here. Please welcome Dr. Tara Jo Manal. Thank you very much. I'm really excited to be here. Um, thank you so much for the invitation. Um, I will say a disclaimer, there's a couple of slides in here that are related to your institution. And in all honesty, they have been in our slide deck. They were not for today. So um, they actually have previously existed. Um, do I need to go? switch. Should I again? Okay, there we go. There we go. So I'm going to talk about um, the concept of workforce in supply and demand, using supply and demand kind of as a conceptual thing to say, where are we right now, in particular in the physical therapy workforce, and related to both supply and demand, because you can be really solid on um, what you think is supply, and then demand changes, and now you're not. So they really are interconnected, and you need to monitor both, really, to make sure that you understand where you are. So physical therapy is the fifth largest clinical um, occupation, and that's excluding um, general nursing. Um, so we're, we're hugging in there um, in, in the top five um, for size. We're about 238,000 physical therapists in the country. And when you think of demand, so how does, the pop, how does the population of the United States think of physical therapy? And for us, the good news is they think favorably, about 87% said they have a positive experience, and 61% who've never been think they would, so that's helpful. 92% um, <laughs> said that the, their experience actually helped them and improved them, and 84% um, said they'd recommend their family and friends, which that's the one you really look for, right? If you, if you would recommend it to others, then, then you're doing something positive. So, so what are we doing to feed this population of physical therapists? So this is a, a graph looking at our growth in programs. So the left-hand graph, um, 2022, there's 271 programs and 23 in candidacy status. That means those are programs that should come to fruition um, through 2027. So we actually have a pulse on the number of programs that would exist for years in the future because there's a pathway in order to become accredited that is slow enough that we could monitor it. So this takes us through 2027. And on the right side, although you don't need to know the numbers, the bars you saw really big on the bottom, but they're steady after that, that's our applicant pool. So our applicant pool was larger in 2017, 18, but it's stable. And so you look at all the years since then, and it's a stable applicant pool. And we just need to make sure that that continues to be stable and or grow if we want to seek potential growth in programs. This is our year-over-year -year growth in applicant diversity. And while it's growing, and promise that the one line is bigger than the other, it's slow, right? Um, so we're looking and hovering around 37% diversity in the applicant pool for the profession of physical therapy, and we know that that does not represent all the patients that we serve. So although we're showing progress, we want that to become exponential and not, not at the pace of growth that we're seeing on this slide. 
Graduate growth also is increasing, um, and our projected graduation um, amount for 2024 is around 13,000. So we're looking at seeing about 13,000 enter the field in 2024 based on our current um, programs. This really looks at a um, number of physical therapists per 100,000 population and physical therapist assistants. And the point really of this is not so much what the number is, is that it continues to improve. So we are growing and we are, um, and we are not being outpaced by population growth. That's a good thing if we have a desire to serve more individuals. We need to not get outpaced by population or we will serve less individuals. But that's the macro level. What happens at the micro level? This happens to be Texas data. Um, Texas is one of only eight states that actually publish their workforce data in physical therapy as well as other health professions. And that should be shocking because there's only eight states that public, publicly um, share that data at the level of licensure. And that's something I'll get to later. It's a problem. Um, but what you'll see is you've had, um, in Texas alone, you've had 56% growth in physical therapy since 2012 in your state. So you are seeing that's quite exponential in growth in your state. Um, and the other declining line is the relationship to the population, which is a good thing. So you're seeing more physical therapists, so there's less people per physical therapist, which is what you want if you need to serve the unserved as well as the underserved. Because remember, unserved are people who never got therapy in the first place, not just that they're underserved and couldn't access, but no one's even thinking of them as needing the care. And that if we want to tackle that, we need to have enough humans um, who are trained in physical therapy to do that work and physical therapy assistant. But also on the micro level, where are they, right? So again, Texas is one of those few states that gives this information. You'll see the ratio of one physical, of the population to one physical therapist is higher in non-metropolitan areas and it's higher in border counties compared to non-border counties. And 45 counties in Texas have no physical therapists at all. So understanding this at the micro level is critical um, if we really want to deal with caring for people who need care. How are we going to bridge this gap? And, and there are some good, great things that could come. And we'll talk about digital and, and technology as one of those in a second. The other thing I wanted to mention was just the age distribution of physical therapists. Um, we hover between 25 and 55. That's about where the most of our, our physical therapists are in age. But in Texas right now, in 2022, 4.3% of your physical therapists were aged um, 65 and over. But in 10 years, 17% of your physical therapists will be age 65 and older. So we need to feed the younger end of this or you're going to end up with retirements that are starting to outpace. So you have 10 years of, of forecasting here, right? This is foresight. So how do we think about what we're going to do about that so that we don't lose this huge bolus at 65 in 10 years? Um, this is an example of a recent pulse we did in 2022 on vacancy and outpatient orthopedics. And this just says that basically in the study that we did, one in two outpatient orthopedic clinics had an opening for physical therapists, and one in nine um, outpatient clinics had an opening for physical therapist assistants. So we're trying to get at this issue of, demand, of um, is our supply sufficient and where are our vacancies? Um, because... We had a major disruption, and that was COVID. COVID did change everything. Not only did it introduce a huge new population of patients, which is changing our demand, but it actually impacted our healthcare providers. And I think Erica did a great job of describing what every single physical therapist who survived that pandemic, as well as the practitioners in all of our areas, need. They need their own coach to have gotten through what we went through and come out on the other side a healthy provider. That's a serious concern that we have to think about. There was a study done in 2021 by Definitive Healthcare, and they said following I, um, NPI numbers, that's how they tracked physical therapists in this particular study, 22,000 left the field billing through their NPI in 2021. Um, we do know some people seem to be coming back. We're hearing about that, and we're, looking, we're doing another study now on that. But just take note, we graduated 12,000 in one year and lost 22. That's not going to work long term. So really thinking about what this implication is to us. We have done also a post-COVID, we did four, this is our fourth post-COVID survey, um, and we found that about between eight and nine percent of physical therapists and physical therapy assistants are work less are working full-time. So that percentage left full-time work. And about five percent of both groups 
have increased their part-time work. And so we're seeing a shift. Um, and not all of them went from full-time to part-time. So they went to either something in between or something else altogether. Um, and so again, thinking about how do we use this information to be sure that we're able to provide the care that we need to help the health of society. Um, they're also working multiple jobs. Pre-pandemic, um, there was smaller percentages working more than one position than post-pandemic. And some of this is by design. We're hearing more about students um, in their first positions that are saying, give me the minimum hours to get benefits, and I'm going to do something else with my other time. And sometimes that's revenue generating, sometimes it's in the field, sometimes it's not. Um, and so that will shift these numbers. And it's, again, things we need to be monitoring and thinking about. But we know that administrative burden is a contributor to burnout, and burnout is a contributor to leading the profession. And so while we've also done a, this is an infographic from our administrative burden study that, that came out last year, but what, what's important to me about this is we can't lose anyone. They take too long to train. So what is it that we're thinking about to keep those who are here in and keep those who get those who left to come back? What do we need to do? And we really need to start thinking in that mindset because the, the pathway to training is pretty stable, as you saw. It's not growing exponentially to make up for losses. But again, one example was 75% of the respondents said that 25% the of their time is being spent on prior authorizations just to get patients in the door. That administrative burden is not sustainable, and that is going to contribute to burnout. Pre-pandemic, telehealth really did blow up in the pandemic. And we have great data. I didn't bring it. But we have lots of data about what happened during the pandemic. And the amount of telehealth was over you know, the moon because everyone moved to it. It was a crisis situation. But we did see that although it's gone down again, it's, it has increased permanently. So pre-pandemic, 4% of PTs were doing telehealth. Post-pandemic, 33% are doing telehealth. So this is not going anywhere. But patients' perception in our consumer research study said that they're not really likely to use it. So they have less confidence in it, and they don't think they're going to get as good care if they use telehealth. So it's not about the right thing for everyone. It's about the right thing for the right person. And we have to match that accurately, or we will fulfill their belief, right, if we're, if we're not choosing the best patients for telehealth. We'll convince them they were right. So we also have done a paper on a report on the digitally enabled physical therapist. And this talks not just about telehealth now. It's all digitally enabled care, all those things supported by technology and digital enhancement. And so it's something that we feel strongly about is physical therapists need to move in this direction. Right now, about 5% of physical therapists are using some form of remote monitoring. But we now have remote monitoring codes that can be used and, and built for. And so this number should be excellent exponential if we're keeping up with the growth in the field. And this will change, um, I hope, in the next few years dramatically. And But remember that, that with that comes responsibility. So some of the apps and things that people are, are thinking would be helpful to their patient care may actually not be safe. They may not have good safeguards around patient data or the how it's accessed or where it's stored. And so we all we just opened um, a portal that's called Orca, and Orca is the company we, we um, collaborated with, and they do app analysis. And so a physical therapist from the American Physical Therapy Association can log in, and from that login, they can find digitally enabled apps that have passed the ORCA test, which is a safety test. And it, we're using, we have about 400 users. We just launched it a couple months ago. Um, but physical therapists actually from the app, right into the um, ORCA database can send their patient an email with the app connected to it. So it goes directly out of that to them. You don't have to email them directly. So you go into the portal, you know that these are safe, and then you can send them direct to, directly to your patient. And that's an example of the things that we're trying to do to stay both in front of and um, parallel to digital health. But the idea that you know we can't do telehealth and physical therapy, we know is not true. We've proven it now. The pandemic gave us that, if, if nothing else. Um, but we have PTs that are doing telehealth right now in space. So um, this is Major Daniel um, Anderson. And she is the first Air Force physical therapist chosen to support NASA's mission on human spaceflight. And they're preparing how they're going to manage people going to Mars. And so we will all be providing care remotely because we're not going with, you know, there's just not enough space. Um, so this is not a maybe. This is a thing. And it's going to be happening. And it's, and, and it's growing in our field. So what are the kind of things that are driving this digital change, which might be both a drain on our demand and, and a support to our supply? 
right? This can go both ways. And so digital health in, its, in essence is something to be thinking about. Digital health platforms are definitely pushing this agenda. Um, the gig economy of our physical therapist. You know, how do you do protective care? It may be that you do one-on-one -on -one care in person for a portion of your time and the other is telehealth and that actually alleviates some stress and makes it more convenient because you can do that on the day you do a half day and so you're more available for your family. Like these are the things that are happening that we need to be embracing to keep our people from burning out and to keep them in the workforce. Apps again as I mentioned and again I just want to say please consider the security around those. And then legislation we now have um, remote therapeutic monitoring codes that we can be billing for. So that will encourage us to be using this technology more effectively. And then private equity investment is absolutely driving this area. That That is just a fact. So the digital health um, technologies industry is about 3.5 billion today, and it's expected to be 23.5 in 10 years. So this will drive this, and it's something that we need to look to as a solution for these issues of supply and demand um, and not an enemy of those. Um, this really swear has been in our slide deck. I'm not making it up. Um, it's been in our slide deck for about a, a year. Um, and it's the idea that, that it is groups like this group who is saying, we know we need to push this. We know we need to get behind this. We know we need to collaborate in this space or it won't end up in the direction that we think is best for the health of society, which is our mutual goal. And so hats off for, for being in this space and um, swear, it's in our slide deck. So um, digital health won't replace traditional physical therapy. It will not, but the digitally enabled physical therapist will replace the non-digitally literate physical therapist at some time. I don't know the day, I don't know the time, but at some time, this will cross. And so what we have to think about is the health of the profession, is how do we maximize these benefits and minimize the negatives to really do this in an effective way. The other thing I just wanted to say is that something that happens to one of us happens to all of us. Um, and that's one of the things I love most about this, this interdisciplinary environment that you're in is that you're more keen to that than those that live in a little bit more silos. Um, so this is an example of projected physician shortages by 2034. And physician assistants are going to be impacted by this, but so will physical therapists. If, if you look at some of the places, we've got primary care, emergency care, neuro, those are places where they, there's just going to be a shortage, we will have to help. And so it will change our practice to help with this challenge. That will make space for somebody to come into things that we're currently doing as we leave that space. And I think that we've really described the, the chain of the people who can help us do that. And, and health wellness coaching would be a great example of that. Um, Medicare Advantage Disenrollment Study. This is an example of how, like, you know, the, the um, insurance environment changes our practice and affects supply and demand. So they've been looking at disenrollments. That's a stat that they've been looking at, but it's one-year disenrollments. So this study just came out, and it's five-year disenrollments. And what they found was one-year, 13%, not a big deal. Five-year, we're talking 50% on average. And by the way, there's all kinds of issues of disparity in this as well. Um, it's a really great paper if you have time. But what scares me about this study is now we're looking at longer term. So are the insurance companies, right? Like they, we don't get to hide this data. So the plans aren't going to financially benefit if they're doing investment in chronic long-term things, if they know that in five years a bunch of these people are going to leave their program. Because they're going somewhere else, so they're going to benefit from what they've invested in. So if they're afraid of this churn, then are they going to change the way they invest and address chronic illnesses? Because they're not going to get the long-term benefits. That's what I worry about. So that's what scares me about this study. So what are the kinds of factors that we're talking about that can influence demand? Well, population and payer distribution right, is seriously an issue. And then, you know, the Medicare Advantage is an example of how something in the insurance environment could really change the demand or supply of our, of our ability to provide care. Healthcare professional trends, right? So primary care crisis, that's going to affect um, the demand on physical therapy. 
projected shortage of surgeons, emergency room physicians, and neurophysicians is going to impact us. Absolutely. And you can look at it both ways. I might receive less referrals because there's less of people to refer to me who can see patients, or I might end up stepping into that space and helping treat those patients in a different triage level where they've been determined that they're, more, they're appropriate to come directly to me and we can avoid that step. I don't know how that will shake out, but something will change. Innovations in medicine. I threw up TPA, but you could obviously use COVID as well as an example of something that's dramatically changed our population and those patients that may be referred, but TPA being used in acute stroke. So once that medicine came on the market, it changed the trajectory of stroke recovery after immediate stroke if care is provided in an acute way. And that changed the role and demand on physical therapy instantly the, as soon as that came out. So these things have to be monitored because they influence supply and demand and us being ready to care for the health of society. And then policy would be an example. There's currently uh, uh, HR 2, uh, 2480, which is Optimizing Postpartum Outcomes Act. And one of the things is that those after um, delivery should have the right to have an evaluation and treatment for issues related to delivery for uh, women's health, urinary incontinence, other issues. And if that goes through, we will now have a bolus of people looking for specialized individuals with this skill set across the country. And this could be this year. So are we ready? And are we thinking about where, the, where they are and how we get the right patients to the right providers? And then obviously PT and PTA specific um, practice patterns would be another example. So what is the APTA going to do about this? Um, so we're monitoring. Um, that's always a good answer. But we're working actually with economists um, to predict, to put a new supply and demand model. Um, COVID and all the aftermath of COVID have blown up our supply and demand models. Um, they're not as stable as they have been for many, many years. So we're going to start from the ground up and, and relook at supply and demand given all this disruption that we know has happened. So in 2024, we will be putting out a new supply demand model um, for the next till 2038. Um, and then identifying and prioritizing knowledge gaps that would inform this model over time. So what don't we know? I mean, I showed you some of the Texas data, but remember, that's only eight states that even published it, and they don't all publish the same data. So we're looking at um, a minimum data set. Um, this has been a collaboration among multiple providers in Federation of State Boards Physical Therapy and the state boards of many of our um, of your license licenses, as well as your colleagues' licenses, they've gotten together and created a minimum data set that they're all agreeing to. Um, that's just step one. Step two is that every state actually collects it and then shares it. So those are a lot of steps. That sounds like three. Um, that's a really long haul. First, some states don't collect data and on, on their licensees and refuse to, um, and that will be a big change. So this is a long one but it's something that we will all be able to do together because what affects one of us affects all of us. Um, and, let's, sorry. Yeah, so um, prioritizing knowledge gaps, I mentioned, sorry, um, emerging trends. And then this minimum data set, as I mentioned, um, is something that even if we could get at the level of our, diff of our individual professional associations would be at least that data on those individuals. But at the state level, that's where we can be sure we're not duplicating people, but also we need to get at the micro level of location because distribution across the state is not the same as knowing how many people are in the state. And so when we think about this, this is the mapping that would then project where we send, train, and and create satellites and hybrids, where should they go? They need to go where we need to have the people who graduate stay. Does that make sense? So it even affects educational program growth. Everything will be affected um, when we can create this map for all of us. Thank you. I was excited that you recognized our tech stars affiliation. So yeah, we are working with digital health companies and how it might affect PT in the future. So thank you so much. Uh, as we continue our evening, I'd like to introduce you to our final speaker, PA Todd Pickard. PA Pickard serves as a vice president and speaker of the house in the American Academy of Physician Associates, the national organization that advocates for all PAs and provides tools to improve PA practice and patient care. He is currently the Executive Director of Advanced Practice in the Office of the Chief Medical Executive at MD Anderson,
Cancer Center, where he works closely with other APP leadership to lead over 1,100 APRNs and PAs. He has worked at the University of Texas Medical Center for over 25 years as a PA himself. His clinical practices included urology, breast medical oncology, GI medical oncology, head and neck medical oncology, and clinical cancer prevention. Please welcome PA Todd Pickard. Well, first off, thank you very much uh, for letting me be here and speaking with you this evening around workforce issues. And secondly, um, ditto. You know, as, you know, as, as they recognize, there is a, a chain and we're all interconnected. And so there shouldn't be a whole lot of surprises. Um, and so one of the things that I think it's important to recall is what is some of what is driving care right now? What is driving it? And, and so this is really small print over there. So, I have, um, so right now we have high pressure to make sure that we're delivering valuable care because people are counting what we're spending and they're measuring the outcomes. We're also being told we have to produce as providers. You've got to earn your keep, basically. And we have to provide patient experience. And surprise, and surprise, COVID has turned things into, I want instant access at all times to healthcare. And that is a reality. Um, there's also, sorry, a lot of regulation. Um, Politicians can't seem to leave us alone. Um, if you think about it, uh, healthcare in the United States is, is more regulated than anywhere else on the planet. That's why, have you ever heard of medical tourism, where somebody will go to India to get their cataracts done, and it's 10 times less than the price here? Regulations are part of what drives that. <clears throat> Accreditation, so if you work at a large institution like at MD Anderson, we panic every time we hear joint commissions in the vicinity. Um, so that also drives what we do and how we do it and the costs that are included. Uh, and then there's quality and safety, which is really important now. People want us to not injure. I don't know what's going on with the <laughs> screen. Oh, you're trying to zoom in for my poor eyes. Thank you. Then you'll have to zoom back out in a second. I'll let you know when. <clears throat> and then there's quality and safety. Because, uh, frankly, patients don't like it when we hurt them. Uh, and, and nobody should. And, and folks want us to prove that what we are doing actually has measurable outcomes. Uh, and then, of course, right in the middle of that is personalized care. You can zoom back out. Uh, is personalized care because we, we know that patients are not monoliths. Everybody who comes to you with diabetes or hypertension is not like everybody else. Uh, and that's particularly true in my field. Uh, and then, surprise, surprise, now we have all these other things happening. There's burnout, the great retirement. She showed a beautiful graph of all the people who have left in that one year. Um, there is uh, an explosion of data that we're all supposed to keep up with. Uh, and then COVID-19, which is here to stay. You know, uh, my family often asks me, when are we ever going to recover from COVID-19? I said, never. It's a new, a new disease state, just like the flu. It's here forever, and it will have an impact on us forever. I don't know what that impact's going to be 10 years from now, but it's, it's here. It isn't disappearing. Okay, so I don't know why this is so tiny for me. Uh, and, and it's the formatting is really off here. Um, but basically, PAs have been around for 50 years, and we're still a mystery to the universe. There's questions about what do we do, what are our team roles, how do we share burdens with each other, you know, how are we mutually accountable, we also know that we're doing a ton of coordination of care that is very complex. And people still don't understand our training, our scope of practice, what type of licensed practice means, how we hire people, um, and how we, what are the models of care that we practice under, and then compensation. You know, how do we pay people? Uh, it's, it's really interesting. Um, when I started as a PA 25 years ago, and, and I work for the state of Texas. Any of you can Google my salary right now. So I'm not telling you anything surprising. Um, I started at $50,000. New grads are going to be hired at $115,000 at my institution. So compensation has changed, and then that helps drive, well, you better earn more money, and it better be high quality and high value, because if it's not, the payers aren't going to pay for it. So that is really important, and this applies basically to anybody in medicine, particularly advanced practice nurses, physical therapists, anybody who's not a physician. Um, we really have to sometimes talk about this is what we do, this is how we were trained, 
you know, and, and people will be surprised. Say, oh, you can prescribe? Well, yeah, we've been prescribing in Texas now for more than 20 years. Now it's just scooching over. I'm trying to go to the next slide. I, I, honestly, I'm not trying to be the difficult one. <laughs> so let's talk about PAs. And I want to thank the American Academy of PAs for helping me. They have a tremendous uh, communications team. Uh, so I can't take responsibility if, if there's anything flashy up there. So it is a great time to, to be a PA. There are more than 168,000 practicing. If you, if you ask NCCPA, there, so there's 200,000 that were certified. Well, not everybody that's certified continues to practice. People do retire. Um, and so, uh, and of course, you stole my thunder. By 2031, the PAs are going to be increasing by 28%. Um, so, yay for a physical therapist and PAs. Um, more and more students are coming into our, our profession. Uh, there are more now than 300 PA programs. When I started, in the, when dinosaurs roamed the earth, uh, there were about 50 PA programs in the country. Uh, and it has exploded. I mean, it, it is just amazing. And there's more on track all the time. Um, earlier this year, um, U.S. News and World Report named PA the top number two, top healthcare job. And for the six year, and that's for the six year running, um, we're also one of the top five jobs amongst all occupations. So it's a good thing to be a PA. Um, and I already alluded to the fact that salaries are way high compared to back in my day. So it's a great time to, to enter the PA profession for those new grads. So our profession is, is stronger than ever, uh, well positioned to expand and to really come into those gaps that have been alluded to. Every time somebody is not there, other members of the team step up and we continuously just leave gaps behind us. So it'll be interesting to see how this all flushes out in the next 25 years. <clears throat> so, um, last year, AAPA launched our PA brand, PAs Go Beyond, uh, and in that time, we've made uh, a lot of progress in terms of educating the, the, the public about what PAs are and what PAs do, because it's not intuitive, uh, particularly with our title. Um, you'll notice that most of us who are PAs say PA, and that's kind of like KFC used to be Kentucky Fried Chicken, but everybody now knows it as KFC, because it's just, it's easier, and you just remember that thing. So PAs were, you know, depending on who you ask, were born physician associates or physician assistant. But both of those terms can be confusing to patients because they know what a physician is. They know what a nurse is. They know what a physical therapist is. But I've had people ask me, so do you follow the doctor around and take notes and bring him coffee? It's like, no, that's not the type of assisting I do. And, you know, no one that I know of that I've ever worked with would think that of me. Uh, and so it, it can be confusing. But so we are trying to make sure that patients and physician partners and nurses and payers know who we are. Because many times there's a great deal of confusion about what the heck is a PA. Um, so I think it's important that we're emphasizing that we are trusted regular, rigorous, rigorously, sorry, educated, and we're uh, actually trained healthcare professionals. You know, we're not anybody's assistants. Uh, and we really are, are, are transforming health because our focus has been like a laser on patients and how we team with other people. PAs were into teams before teaming was cool because that's in our DNA. If you ask any PA in the room, our job is to connect, contribute, and if there's a problem, we're going to fix it. That's what we do each and every day, not just for our patients, but for everybody we work with. So it's really a critical that we continue to educate and ensure that people know who we are and what we're doing. Because any PA who's ever been in the field, you will f it was not going away. There'll be some point, at some point in the day, where you're going to have to explain what's a PA and what do you do? And are you fetching coffee or not? So that is in the PA DNA as well, as we're trained. I'm sure you all are doing that. What's your 30-second elevator speech of what's a PA? Well, it doesn't go away. And I've been doing it for 25 years. <clears throat> so one of the things uh, that we have done as an academy recently is we really wanted to um, I want to go back I feel like I skipped a slide okay nope I'm on track uh, so one of those things that, that we uh, have done is really to understand um, what does society think of PAs? So we worked with Harris 
Polling Group. I don't know if any of y'all have ever heard of them, but they're kind of a big polling company. And what we found out is that more than 90% of, of those folks that an, a, answered our survey agreed that barriers that hinder PAs from taking care of them and doing what we need to do should be removed. And that we should work based on our experience and our training and what we can bring to the table. Imagine that, letting people who've been trained to do things do the things they've been trained to do. <clears throat> so um, it's important that um, we work on this, and this is something that the American Academy of PAs do, and many of the PAs in this room and that are part of Texas Academy of PAs know. We go to Austin, we go to the Legislative Hill. You know, next week, Lauren and I will be in DC going to, we'll have to look you up, um, at going to talk to our congressman and, and try to change rules so that really what we want is barriers that prevent each of us from doing the work that we're trained to do. We want those removed. And when we do the work, we want to be reimbursed for it. And if we have patients who have diabetes, for God's sake, let us give them diabetic shoes. Don't make them go somewhere else just to get their shoe prescription. That is just insanity and stupidity at its finest. <clears throat> so the PA profession is in demand as a top job and it's expanding a lot of, of growth. But we also know that PAs are stepping up into leadership roles. When I joined MD Anderson 25 years ago, um, there were less than 50 APRNs and PAs total, like in the whole place. Now there's 1,100. There was no such thing as an AP supervisor, a PA manager, a director, an executive director of advanced practice. We just worked willy-nilly with whomever. Uh, and frankly, uh, a lot of people didn't know what we could or couldn't do. And there was, you know, you'd ask a physician, you know, about your evaluation. He's like, oh, God, I have to evaluate you. Well, how do I do that? So there's, there's been a lot of momentum uh, within the PA profession for people to step up into leadership roles. And now about 30% of PAs either have a formal role, uh, and the most fun thing is that many of us are informally doing this work anyway uh, and not being compensated for it or supported, but we do the work because, again, that's part of our DNA. So it's important to know that we, uh, we support PA leaders, and if any of you have time next week, come to D.C. and be part of the Leadership and Advocacy Summit. Because part of what we do besides advocacy is we train leaders. Uh, and that's one of the most important things of the work that I do nationally and through the state and at, at my institution is I try to build capacity. Because these challenges that we've talked about tonight are not going away. And we need to have leaders who are prepared to take action and remove barriers and focus like a laser on patience because that's why we're here. So some reimbursement updates. How many of you have heard about split shared billing? You know, it, it makes me nervous because under that model, it is t completely time-based. It's a proposal that everything that we do in, in medicine, uh, particularly for the government and what the government says, everybody eventually says, um, is basically we should keep track of how much time I spent with the patient, how much time the physician spent with the patient, and then whoever spent the most time gets to bill. Well, in my mind, surprise, surprise, the physician's always going to have spent at least five to ten seconds longer than me. Because who's counting? And how are you going to document who actually spent? Are there going to be time stamps? Are we going to be wearing chips and everybody knows where we were at any one time? So I'm, I'm concerned about that. But the good news is, for now, um, <clears throat> that has been delayed to December 2024. And really right now what you can do is that a PA and a physician can combine their work together. Uh, you document who did what. And depending on you know, who did the physical exam or made the medical decision making, or you can use time. That's the person that bills. It's still fraught with, pro it's problematic. If you ask anybody who is in leadership and, and works with APRNs or PAs of, of any sort, it is very difficult to measure who's doing what. Because many times things just get shifted under the physician. The physician might have been in China at the time, but somehow it ends up under the, the physician's name. Uh, and so that is, that is an, a, a thing that is important and will continue in the workforce to finding metrics so that you can prove value and articulate productivity and then say, this is why I'm worth how much you're paying me a year. That is a challenge that the workforce is facing and will continue to face for some time. COVID burnout and COVID amnesia is real. Um, there has been a great retirement has, has been alluded to. 
Um, PAs have burnout just like everybody else does. And it's, it's nuanced because, and I'll show this to you in a second, if you ask PAs, do you feel like you're optimally being used and that this is the greatest career on earth? Only 15.5% say yes, right? Because there's tons of opportunities for us to do better. But if you ask, um, and I'll show that in a minute, so I'm gonna hold on to that. But it's also important that people are moving around. Remember PAs are top five healthcare job, number two, we can, we can move. So people move. PAs are mobile. If they're unhappy with a person or a place or a policy or an institution, they can find another job. So it is very common. 59.6% of PAs have quit or taken another position, and 54% are thinking about reducing their work. This is a new phenomenon. This, this thing about just taking the minimum number of hours to make the benefits, there's this desire to spend more time not just working. People are looking for balance in their lives because we've been doing it the other way for so long where we sacrifice ourselves and that's why we're burning out. So these figures might seem a little bit daunting, but here's the bright side. <laughs> because PAs are flexible and mobile and team focused, most PAs who are practicing would say, I would agree that if I had to start over today, I'd be a PA again. That's good news. Um, and uh, PAs are very, 79% uh, are optimistic about the future, about where this is going and what our opportunities are and, and are we going in the right direction. I will say, <clears throat> in my time as a PA, my experience has changed tremendously. There was a period of time where you had, used to have to have a sign out in the lobby that said, warning, you might be seen by a PA. <laughs> and that's not a joke. It sounds like a joke now. Um, there was also a time when I would go down to radiology with the 500 pounds of films, because I'm that old. We had actual charts and actual x-rays. Um, and the radiologists would not want to talk to you because you were beneath them as a PA. That changed because what they quickly realized is that the PAs actually knew what they were talking about. When they came down there and the radiologist peppered you with questions, we actually knew. When the physicians, went, when the surgeon went down, the surgeon's like, I don't know, I didn't read the chart, just I'm gonna cut something out. Is this what I'm supposed to cut out? So they learned that we were partners and the radiologists actually became one of our best friends and one of our best advocates because they were like, these PA people, they know their stuff, they know the patients and when I ask questions, they actually give me answers. So I will say that even in my own experience, there has been major change. And I think that's just what we all know is that the only thing that stays the same is gonna change, right? The question is, where are we going as a workforce? And, and you know, employers, whether they be large academic institutions or healthcare systems or private practices or group practices, they're all gonna be facing all of these issues and, and questions and concerns. The good news for all of us though is patients need us. Patients know who we are, they mostly like us. Um, and so I, I think there's opportunity here for us. Um, that is all that I have. And thank you very much. And I'm sorry I couldn't see anything. You did amazing with like the moving slides and changing font size and everything. So thank you so much. And thank you for bringing that all together and because it sort of told a cohesive story. So as we move quickly to the next part of our program, I'd like to invite all of our esteemed guests back to the stage along with the School Health Professions Department Chairs, Dr. Misty Zabolowski, Chair of the Department of Personalized Health and Wellbeing, Dr. Michael Furtado, Chair of the Department of Physical Therapy, and PA Lauren Dobbs, Chair of the Department of PA Studies. So if you, will you all join us up here. Um, So we just have a few questions. First question uh, is for PA Pickard and PA Dobbs. What must employers, professional, profession leaders, and academia do together to position future PAs to have the greatest professional impact in the ever-changing healthcare environment? 
So, you know, one of the things that, that I would ask Lauren to answer is really the partnership, <laughs> is really the partnership um, between what we can do to help academic institutions train PAs. So how can we be better at precepting and proctoring, you know, when they come, are there competencies that we should teach? Because right now I think when we hire a PA, we want to throw them in a clinic and say sink or swim. And we know that's not fair, but how can we partner better as employers with those who train around this concept of preceptor? So, and I would add to that, that first we need to be able to get our students in the door. Um, we need to be able to have preceptors in hospitals and facilities. And so we need these larger healthcare groups to um, work and partner with us on allowing our students to have EMR access and to allowing them to actually do things and touch a patient and be involved. Um, we have some entities that will say, oh, yeah, they can watch. Well, that doesn't teach them everything they need to know. We want them to touch the patient. We want them to not go, oh, is that okay to touch your abdomen? Um, we want them to get in there and do those things. And so that's, I think, one of the first things is to allow these um, healthcare networks to work with us and, and be open-minded enough to be like, yes, a student needs to be in the room doing things with our providers and interacting with them and not just hanging out in the corner. Um, I think that will really help um, get our students in the door. And in addition... Then when it's time when they graduate and we're going out there and seeing patients, there are some specialties that need a little extra care and training and partnering with us on that thing as well and, and working with others on how we pay for that. So. You know, we could talk about this for a very long time because that is a, a very important question. But there's one ask as an employer. Train, whether they're a physical therapist, a wellness coach, a nurse, a PA, whatever. Train them to expect when you get on your first job, you're going to need a transition to practice. And you need to come with humility and the ability to learn new things on the job and processes. And don't come telling us, well, this is not the way I learned it, and I'm already perfect, so why are you asking me anything? <laughs> we need folks that are ready and willing and able to learn new things because every system that they're going to work in, they're going to need to know how to navigate, and they need to come there and be humble about it, and be willing to learn. So instill that in your students so that when they come, it's not a shock or a surprise that I'm going to have to do more training. Like, yeah, it never stops. I'm still learning new things. Yeah, that's great advice for transition to practice. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Manal, you said in your, in your talk that burnout, part of, part of burnout was administrative burden, and we all certainly agree with that. The question I have for you is, as it continues to impact all health professions, how can we, how can interdisciplinary efforts in healthcare work to decrease burnout among PTs? Yeah, that's a great question. So, you know, burnout is a multi-pronged issue, um, just like uh, many things are. And so there are things that enhance burnout and there are things that are protective against burnout. Um, and so I think that what we really need to do is to do the best job we can to leverage what we know about burnout in healthcare in general and figure out what are the things that we can actually make a difference in. For example, there's been studies out there that looked at burnout and asking people um, what they want and what physicians want in response to burnout is different than what nursing wants, as an example. Interestingly, then when they do studies that demonstrate here's interventions, what actually improved burnout, it's some of the things that neither of them wanted. And so there's this disconnect between what I think I need and maybe what I need. Um, and so I say all of that to say it is clearly a, pr a problem and a crisis. And so what we really need to do is focus on what are the actual known interventions that, that are protective against burnout. And one of the biggest things is teamwork and communication. I don't know two words that impact interdisciplinary more than teamwork and communication. Um, and it might be fun to know that there was evidence to suggest that communication training in physicians improved burnout in both physicians and nurses. <laughs> and that wasn't true in other populations. Um, but, it, you know, those are the things that, that make interdisciplinary care work. Um, and the other piece we know is moral distress and moral resilience are things that are both um, you know, dangerous and protective towards burnout. And doing what you know is right and being able to do it is what you need to, to do in order to prevent moral distress. And, and 
that can be even at the organizational level. And I just don't know how you make organizational change unless the entire team is pushing the same agenda. And so that's where teamwork comes in in this interdisciplinary issue is everybody says this must change and we will assist that change to happen because we are a united front. And again, that is towards um, protective against burnout. And so all of those major things to me, which are, are sound simple, but the work is hard, are interdisciplinary by definition. I love that. I, I kind of feel like this forum shows all the similarities that we have. Uh, and then we can work together and not be isolated uh, to work through these issues. Dr. Furtado, how do interprofessional experiences during training equip students for their future professions? Yeah, so if we know that these are the um, components that are going to assist in burnout, then our responsibility as educators are to provide these components in our education. And I think um, in our education systems, we spend a lot of time in discipline-specific training. I have the responsibility to train a physical therapist, to be a licensed physical therapist through accrediting bodies that ask requirements of me for my profession. But what we know as educators is that there's going to be a significant gap in the profession if we don't do interdisciplinary care. We don't train our students to work with other providers. It's critical to have that communication and teamwork. So fostering that early in the education system provides that maybe confidence or ability to say, you know, in school I did an activity or I learned with a PA, so now when I encounter a PA in the clinic, I am more comfortable in communicating with the PA because I understand what they do and I understand how um, my piece of the puzzle fits for the patient. And so I think when we recognize that um, our own individual um, professions don't meet the need of the whole patient and that all of us together meet that need, then, it, then you, you, you meet that educationally. There was a great um, study that was just published by St. Catharines University and they um, gave, it was an activity that they did in an educational setting and it was PTs, OTs, and PAs and they, they gave them a case study. Um, the case study was a geriatric um, person who was experiencing falls. And they just said, go ahead and look at this case and tell us what would be the first thing that you would look at and you would do. Of course, the PTs said, we're going to work on getting up from the floor. We're going to get them on the floor and get them up. And the PA said, um, we want to review their medications to see if, uh, if there are any risks of falls or side effects from the medications. And the OT said, we want to give compensatory. We want to get them a walker to help them with their... Um, activity of daily living, right? So um, then the students communicated and saw each of those needs. And so each had a piece to the puzzle to provide to the patient. And so in learning what each other do, um, and that's, re that's what's really important. And, um, that's what I love what we do here with Whole Health is, you know, we, we instill that soon and provide those opportunities so that our students can go out and do this work in the team, team field. Yeah. Thank you so much. Ms. Jackson, we talked about digital health tonight. Uh, particularly in physical therapy and how it's changing physical therapy. What I'm wondering is how are these technologies um, uh, affecting health and wellness coaches to leverage information in, in your process? Well, it's interesting because I, I don't think there is a shortage of information for patients, right? Uh, what health and wellness coaches can do though is help a patient sort through making sense of that information in their life you know, and make some um, some autonomous choices about the information there is certainly a movement uh, in coaching you know the, the kind of anti AI movement, <laughs> as, as there may be in some other occupations. My perspective, though, is that the possibility for AI to provide connection to populations who are in rural areas, or, you know, as you were saying, there aren't, there aren't PTs <laughs> in every corner of Texas. So uh, that is certainly true of coaching. If that is a way to bridge a gap so that everybody can experience connection, uh, uh, listening, 
and empathy, um, I am all for an integration of, of AI. Thank you. Dr. Zablowski, how can we look towards educating future health and wellness coaches to adapt to these rapidly changes in digital health and the technological innovation, innovations that we discuss? So two things come to mind. The first thing is just teaching them the basics of using this technology. There's so much happening right now. They really need that focused attention to how to use that technology, but also working with them to open their eyes to the possibilities that that technology that you describe um, presents for them and their coaching clients. And then also discovering those dependable tools that are out there and resources that will help elevate that coaching expertise. Um, so there's a couple of ways we can do that, and I'll try to be brief, but I think the first goes back to that digital literacy, the ability to seek, find, and understand the health information that they're receiving, but then also to apply that information to their coaching practice and um, the coaching plans that they're giving their clients. Also staying current with the technology advancements as in educators, um, uh, really promoting that ongoing learning and professional development that helps keep the coaches updated on the advancements and in, in innovations in wellness. Um, as you've, we've mentioned several times today, tech stars and integrating the, um, uh, those, uh, that promotion of technology within the curriculum. So whether that be offering courses on health apps, uh, wearables, telehealth platforms, or just connecting with other um, people who are on the ground doing the work in, in, these, in these tech acts aspects through guest lectures, joint projects, or mentorship programs. And then encouraging not only our coaching students, but practicing coaches um, in participating in research around the technologies that are available to them. And that will only help to continue to grow the field. Um, but then at the end of the day, we really continue or need to continue to focus on those essential soft skills, the communication, the empathy, the active listening, the motivational interviewing that are so essential to coaching in that coach-client relationship, and then ultimately help us maintain that human connection that is so, so important in, um, in the coaching world. Terrific. Well, as we wrap up the evening, can, can we please have a round of applause for our presenters and our panel? I want to thank everyone who helped make this event happen and behind the scenes and in front of the scenes uh, and to our attendees here on campus and virtually. We hope everyone enjoyed the event. The next health workforce event will be Creating Change in Healthcare Delivery hosted by the Texas College of Osteopathic Medicine. That will occur on Monday, October 2nd. Uh, please enjoy your evening and be well. Whatever wellness looks like for you. <laughs> For you, being healthy isn't a choice. It's a way of life. What if you could harness your passion for health and turn it into a career? What if you had the tools and teachers to help you get there? Now you do. And it's right here at the Health Science Center. In 12 short months and 100% online, you can earn your spot among the best health and wellness coaches in the nation. And find yourself at the forefront of an ever-expanding industry filled with careers suited just for you. Our innovative online graduate program features five virtual workshops, an interactive platform that will immerse you in your studies and provide formative feedback throughout and the courses you'll need to make a difference in the world. Continue your health and wellness journey online at the Health Science Center and inspire others to take that first step to a healthier lifestyle. Contact the Health Science Center School of Health Professions to start transforming your future today.